um, versus having the speaker here in person, and that's because um, flights from San Diego were canceled this morning. And so in order for her to actually be able to participate, this was the way that we were gonna do it. So, um, so, so thank you for being part of kind of like our, our first kind of experiment uh, and foray into kind of broadcasting from another UC over into UCCS. So um, my name is Cindy Simmons and I'm Associate Director for UC Center Sacramento. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Um, professor Kate Rickey is an assistant professor at the UC San Diego School of Global Policy and Strategy and holds a joint appointment with the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. She is a climate change scientist who integrates tools for, from the physical and social sciences to analyze climate change problems. Um, central to her work is accounting for uncertainty and heterogeneity, both in the effects of climate change and in preferences for how to address these problems. Professor Ricky recently served as a research associate in the Sibley School of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at Cornell University and a fellow at the Carnegie Institution for Science. She has also served as a visiting investigator, fellow, and postdoctoral researcher at Stanford University. Her current research includes topics ranging from regional climate change effects and international relations implications of solar geoengineering. She has assessed ocean acidification effects on coral reefs, as well as the warming effect from carbon dioxide emissions. Professor Ricky has published and lectured widely in the field of climate change, and we are so pleased we could broadcast her talk today at the center. Please join me in welcoming Professor Kate Ricky, who will talk today on climate geoengineering, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for having me today, and um, I apologize for not being able to be there in person, but hopefully uh, this can still be a, a good experience for all of us. So uh, in any case, I just want to say if there's some sort of um, sound problem or you can't, you want to ask a question in the middle, let's just try and do it the way we would do it if I were there, which is fine with me, and we'll see how it goes. So. Um, uh, I want to give you basically today an introduction to this idea about climate geoengineering, uh, which is this sort of contentious topic uh, in climate science about whether we can sort of deliberately interfere in the climate system in order to counteract effects of global warming. And I'm going to try and sort of give a balanced overview, from my opinion, uh, uh, of like why people are considering it, what some of the positive attributes might be, and what some of the um, risks uh, might be if we uh, move forward with sort of doing research and potentially uh, implementing this type of approach in the future. So with that, I will get started. And just the first point I really need to make when we talk about geoengineering is that you really can't divorce these concepts of climate change and climate engineering. Um, the proposal of geoengineering only exists really within the context of our concerns about climate change in general. And uh, this picture sort of illustrates the system that we're dealing with at the most basic level, which is that we know that climate change is happening because CO2 and other greenhouse gases have been emitted into the atmosphere. They're absorbing the infrared radiation that's emitted from the Earth after it absorbs solar radiation from the sun, and the climate is warming up in uh, response to that. And the problem is, one of the problems is that we don't understand how much the climate is going to warm, and that is the reason that people have been talking about climate engineering. Um, and there are sort of two basic approaches to climate engineering or geoengineering. And one of them is called carbon dioxide removal. And this involves um, basically intervening in this process of greenhouse gases, absorbing infrared radiation um, from, from the earth uh, to reduce that greenhouse effect. And then the other one, which is what I'm gonna focus on mostly today, is called solar geoengineering or solar radiation management. The terminology really hasn't been converged upon yet, 
Um, but this is the idea of actually blocking sunlight before it can be absorbed and re-emitted by the Earth um, in order to cool down the planet that way. So like I said, this is all occurring within the context of uh, climate change in general, right? And so when we're thinking about whether or not to intervene in the climate system, we already are intervening, right? We're in the midst of this massive experiment um, of uh, pumping CO2 into the atmosphere. We don't understand exactly what the outcomes are gonna be. The last time carbon dioxide was this high in the atmosphere was about three million years ago. And we know the world looked very different then. Um, sea levels were perhaps you know 50 feet higher than they are today um, and as you can see this figure just shows in the last 400,000 years sort of what CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere have looked like and you can see we're kind of off going off the charts right now and as a result uh, you know we know global temperatures are going to go up and what are going up um, but we don't know how high they're going to go exactly. And that's both because we don't know how sensitive the climate system is to greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, but also because we don't know how long it's gonna take civilization to sort of get greenhouse gas emissions under control, right? Uh, and as a result, there's all of these climate changes that we can observe that already are happening um, so, for example, uh, we know and we've been able to observe drastic changes in the Earth system, like um, reductions in Arctic sea ice, um, changes to uh, the, um, the cryosphere and ice sheets, for example, in Antarctica, uh, major changes happening that have implications for sea level rise. Um, increasing risks of uh, extreme events like hurricanes, tropical storms. Um, you know, studies are showing more and more that these extreme events do sort of contain the fingerprint of climate change um, and you know, events like Hurricane Harvey, obviously hugely um, damaging from an economic standpoint. Here in California, of course, we have wildfires that have been a huge concern and we know climate change is going to significantly sort of increase our risk of experiencing these very costly deadly fires for example the camp fire in california in 2018 um it is estimated to have cost you know the state of california something around uh, 16 and a half billion dollars so um what do we know about our prospects for climate policy so far? We know, you know, the Paris Climate Agreement, uh, which of course the U.S. at the federal level has withdrawn from. Um, in the Paris Agreement, countries agreed that it looks like anything over sort of 1.5 degrees of, of warming is potentially going to be very damaging in terms of, of impacts of climate change. And um, yet our CO2 emissions keep going up, right? So this shows sort of um, some projected emissions tra trajectories and how they're associated with the warming that will result from those CO2 emissions. And uh, as, of, as of now, sorry, I'm having a few problems. Okay, there we go. Uh, as of now, you know, our, our emissions continue to sort of go on an upward trajectory with some occasional plateaus. Um, but we have not made these changes yet to start bringing them down drastically in the way that climate science is saying we need to in order to stabilize and reduce global temperatures in the near future. And part of the reason for this is that um, that this is so problematic and consequential for CO2 in particular because, you know, CO2 is a, a different kind of air pollutant, right? Um, it's not like um, the, like SOx and NOx, things that we emit from power plants that are conventional air pollutants and that if we stop making those emissions, they, um, they uh, precipitate out of the atmosphere on the time scale of days, right? When CO2 is emitted, it remains in the atmosphere for a really long time. So if we're emitting uh, 
about 10 gigatons of carbon this year. Only about five gigatons of it is getting taken up by the ocean and the um, terrestrial biosphere, and the rest of it is, is staying in the atmosphere for a long time. And, and so for this reason, um, uh, there's a lot of inertia in the climate system associated with this, this carbon these carbon dioxide emissions. Um, and basically, what one thing we know is that if we were to sort of instantly stop carbon dioxide emissions, uh, we still would be um, stuck sort of at this at at the temperature, the global temperature we're at at that point that we stop making our emissions. Right, we're still stuck for a very long time with an elevated global temperature. And so, when we're hearing from climate change impact scientists that the amount of temperature change we've already experienced or that we're locked into already is already potentially um, extremely damaging, then we have to sort of figure out, um, are there other strategies for um, dealing with the effects of those, right? Like I, this just shows you, this is, these are some results from simulations that show you know, rising CO2 and then just zeroing out emissions and sort of what happens to atmospheric uh, CO2 on top and what happens to global temperature change on the bottom, right? So there's a lot of ways that we talk about um, how do we manage the risks associated with climate change. There's a whole slew of policy options, some old and some new that we know about to deal with this uh, problem. And so, for example, the ones that we rightfully so are, are really have been focused on are uh, decarbonizing the energy system, which has a whole bunch of benefits that aren't even related to climate change. Um, you know, trying to uh, incentivize or mandate the reduction of CO2 emissions through something like a carbon tax or cap and trade we can uh, invest in more climate change research to try and understand more about what the impacts are gonna be, where they're gonna be um, feeding into us being able to invest perhaps in, in adaptation, learning to live with the climate change that is already happening and is uh, inevitable to happen. Um, even if we decarbonize very rapidly, doing things like building seawalls, um, coming up with novel insurance uh, schemes, changing, you know, what crops we grow and where. And then geoengineering is sort of this approach that people are talking about that occurs within a potential portfolio of climate change risk mitigation tools. And geoengineering can refer either to um, sort of uh, extreme ways of trying to remove CO2 from the atmosphere, or it can refer to these activities that reflect sunlight to cool down the planet. And there's sort of two um, investments that we can make right now and in the future related to geoengineering as a response to climate change. And the first one is just doing more research on geoengineering, whether we can do it, what what its effects would be both um, physically and from a social systems perspective. And then there's this idea of, of deployment as a potential piece of that portfolio, right? Um, okay, so moving into more directly, what is geoengineering in particular? I just, uh, for those of you that are completely new to this topic, uh, this is sort of a, a definition of what is geoengineering. Um, that's uh, been pretty resilient over the last 10 years, which is just, um, you know, it, it's kind of a catch-all term, but the general aspects of, some, of an activity that make it geoengineering are it has to be something that's deliberately done um, to counteract anthropogenic climate change. It has to be sort of large scale uh, in terms of the intervention into the, the global planetary environment. So this was a definition by the Royal Society that was published in a 2009 report. And like I said, there's, there's two broad classes of activities that are falling under this catch-all term a lot of the time. And the first one is this thing called carbon dioxide removal, CDR, 
which is activities like trying to fertilize the ocean um, in order to um, get um, phytoplankton blooms that would in theory then um, sequester carbon that could be sequestered in the ocean um, or things like just pumping CO2 directly out of the air and storing it underground. And then the second set of activities are called solar radiation management, solar geoengineering, reflecting sunlight. There's a lot of different terms, but this is basically the idea of um, putting things into the atmosphere, into space, into onto the Earth's surface that reflect sunlight before it can be absorbed by the Earth. And so just to say a little bit more about the first type of geoengineering, because I'm really going to focus on solar geoengineering for most of this talk. Um, as carbon dioxide removal is an activity that we're kind of already banking on in the climate policy realm for ways to deal with uh, climate risks. Uh, like I said, even if we zero out all emissions today, um, basically we're, we're stuck with a little bit additional warming and that warming is going to stick around for a really long time. And so if by the time we hit negative greenhouse gas emissions, we're already at a place where um, climate impacts are considered unacceptably high, then we need to find a way to sort of artificially remove some of the excess greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. Um, and that's, some people call that a type of geoengineering, other people call it negative emissions, but in any case, it's already something that's being um, implemented in sort of these integrated assessment models, these policy tools for how do we um, identify pathways to getting the kind of climate outcomes we'd like or avoiding the ones that we think are, are bad. Um, and so, for example, this is from the IPCC special report on 1.5 degrees, so that temperature target that was identified in the Paris Climate Agreement, and it shows that basically um, what models are telling us is that in order to meet a temperature target like 1.5 degrees, not only do we need to eliminate all greenhouse gas emissions, um, in the coming decades, but by mid-century, we really need to actually be removing uh, CO2 from the atmosphere. We need to be net negative. Um, otherwise, uh, we're not going to be able to meet that temperature target. There we go. So just to say a few more words about carbon dioxide removal, there's a lot of proposals out there for carbon dioxide removal. Um, the main problem with it is that there's nothing yet that's been demonstrated at scale that can be implemented, scaled up in an in a economically feasible way. Um, so our models, we're sort of building it into our policy models and hoping that it's going to work out, um, but it's not, um, it's not, nothing is for sure yet, right? Uh, and so all these CDR approaches that have been proposed, uh, it, there's no silver bullet that's been identified there yet, and there's not many people working in the space that would say that anything's truly uh, a silver bullet on the uh, horizon, especially in terms of being both scalable um, inexpensive and without sort of um, potentially serious local impacts of their own, like a big land use changes that would require um, eliminating terrestrial ecosystems that we care about, for example. So this is really, that's all just the context within which we have this conversation about solar geoengineering. And so what is solar geoengineering? Um, Basically, this, the, this is the basic physics behind this idea, right? Which is just the climate system works in a way such that of um, the solar radiation that hits the earth, which is just the, the yellow um, line in this little doodle I have here, about 30% of that sunlight right now is reflected right back into space before it's absorbed by the earth. And the other 70% is basically absorbed by the surface of the earth 
uh, re-emitted, and then it interacts with the atmosphere in a way that solar radiation doesn't. Um, and uh, in particular, it interacts with greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, such that the gases in the atmosphere then absorb um, the terrestrial radiation, and they re-emit it, some back down towards Earth, some back towards the upper atmosphere. Um, and as a result, sort of the atmosphere recycles this terrestrial energy, and it warms up the planet. So if we want to warm up the planet even more, uh, we can add greenhouse gases to sort of enhance that recycling effect of the atmosphere. And that's what we're doing right now by adding CO2 into the atmosphere. And so if you want to cool down the planet, um, if you don't want this global warming to happen, you have to, the conventional approach is, okay, well, what we need to do is remove those greenhouse gases from the atmosphere, right? And so that's, that's one approach, and it's the approach that most people have advocated for so far for dealing with climate change. But the other option is to tinker with this yellow outgoing arrow and increase the amount of sunlight that's, that's um, being reflected back into space before it can get absorbed with, by the Earth and before it can interact with the atmosphere in the same way that terrestrial radiation does. And so there's these two options for cooling the Earth, and now people are talking about this sunlight option as well. So um, the idea is how would we use solar geoengineering to reduce global warming? We don't necessarily get rid of all the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere on the time scale uh, to reduce risks. So in addition to having this additional CO2 and other greenhouse gases amplifying this recycling effect of the atmosphere, we also are making this, this outgoing solar radiation arrow bigger in order to counteract that effect. And so how would we actually do that? Um, we're kind of drawing, uh, for the main two approaches people are talking about right now, we're sort of drawing from two analogs of things we can already observe that have happened in the climate system. The first one has to do with these volcanoes, big volcanic eruptions. So this picture shows uh, the eruption of Mount Pinatubo in 1991 which resulted in a bunch of sulfate aerosol getting injected into the stratosphere. Um, and, and basically, whenever there have been these very large volcanic eruptions that put a lot of aerosol precursors into the stratosphere, we actually have been able to observe when that happens that uh, global temperatures are reduced. So, um, those, those precursors in the stratosphere, they spread out. Uh, they stay there for a long time because the, the stratosphere is very stable compared to the trope we live. And they reflect sunlight back into space and we can see the Earth cool down. It happened when Pinotubo and these other large eruptions have, um, have happened in the past. The other big proposal that people are talking about and investing research time into is this idea of marine cloud brightening. And the analog here that we've been able to draw upon is uh, ship tracks and the aerosols associated with ship tracks going across the ocean. Um, and basically when, um, when uh, ships make emissions of particles into the marine uh, boundary layer, we sometimes see brightening of the clouds in that region. Uh, and brighter clouds reflect more sunlight. And so that's another way that you could reflect more sunlight into space by brightening certain types of clouds. And um, operationally, what this might look like, what's been proposed is this idea that there would basically be a fleet of ships in areas over the ocean that are amenable to this kind of brightening. Um, they would go around perhaps spraying something like sea salt in order to increase the reflectivity of clouds, and that could be used to cool down the planet. Now, this is an approach that uh, we don't understand as well as um, the stratospheric geoengineering approach so far, because uh, aerosol cloud interactions are still something that aren't particularly well understood compared to other types of forcing we observe in the climate system, right? So 
as many of you who study climate change know, one of the big uncertainties in how much global warming will happen due to the emissions that we've done so far have to do with our uncertainties about the interactions between um, clouds and aerosols. Uh, clouds are one of the big sort of complicating factors in us narrowing down that amount of warming uh, that we expect to observe in the near future. And the other reason is that um, reflecting sunlight in this way would be a lot more spatially heterogeneous doing stratospheric uh, solar geoengineering um, because you can only do it over the ocean for one thing, but there's only certain areas of the atmosphere over the ocean that are really good candidates for brightening clouds as well. And so there's just a lot more unknowns about how much you could even cool down the planet by using this type of technology. All right, I want, so I wanna tell you a little bit about just breaking it down from what we know about this, this technology of solar geoengineering. What are the good aspects of it and sort of the bad aspects of it and the really worrisome things from what we know from the science so far? So I'll start with the good. Um, and uh, this is the first picture I'm gonna put up, which might not uh, look like a good thing, but actually, um, like I told you, when Mount Pinatubo erupt erupted in 1991, we actually observed a global cooling. So the, the great thing about solar geoengineering and the fact that we have this natural analog that we've observed in the past the great thing is that we know that it would work. We know that it would work to the extent that we could use something like this to cool down the planet on a very short time scale. And that's because we, have, we understand some things about what happens to the climate system after a large volcanic eruption. Right, so basically whenever there's a really large volcanic eruption, it blasts a bunch of stuff through the troposphere where we live um, up into the stratosphere. And so unlike down here in the troposphere, the stratosphere is, is it convectively stable, right? So it mean, that means that it's, um, it's uh, uh, warmer on the top than on the bottom. And so we don't get all this turbulence that we get down near the surface of the earth. Um, and what that means is that when we put something up into the stratosphere, when we put particles up there, they stay there for a long time compared to things in the troposphere. Um, so when a volcano puts all of the sulfur dioxide up into the, to the stratosphere, um, it has, over the course of a couple weeks, it forms aerosol particles, and then they sit there for on average about a year and a half reflecting sunlight back into space. And we know from observations that this cools down the earth. Um, so, uh, you know, after Mount Pinatubo erupted, uh, we observed a global scale cooling of about a half a degree centigrade. The other thing uh, that we know about uh, solar geoengineering, especially the stratospheric kind, is that it doesn't require any large technological innovations in order for us to happen. Um, basically, there have been some studies done. Like I said, we already understand the mechanism um, and the effect, the climate effect. And so there have been some studies done now, including this one that was um, commissioned um, uh, that an aeronautical engineering firm did about 10 years ago now to investigate whether it would be possible to be, do sort of this sulfuric acid misting in the stratosphere. And the gist of that study and a couple of follow-up studies has been that um, basically the anticipated growth in greenhouse gases over the next half century or so could be offset. Um, using sort of known technologies in multiple different ways uh, for less than $10 billion a year. And so that's less than 10 billion in direct costs of getting this global scale cooling, right? Not talking yet about the costs of the side effects or um, any of the 
inequities or, or, or discord that might result from actually doing something like this. So $10 billion a year, that's, you know, about half of NASA's budget. It's, it's less than 0.1% of US GDP. And it's much cheaper than, you know, decarbonizing the entire energy system for the effect you get on global temperature in the immediate future, right? Um, and so it's relatively inexpensive. We know it works uh, in terms of its global cooling effect. And uh, then finally, the other element of the good is that um, we have done a lot of climate modeling studies at this point over the last 10 years that show that it actually, in terms of its regional effects, seems to work pretty well as well at counteracting the direct climate effects from, from the warming effects of greenhouse gases. So this is these are some maps from a study that was done um, more than 10 years ago now, but actually the results have remained pretty um, robust. And, and what this study shows is these are two maps on the left of of temperature from climate model simulations and precipitation on the right from climate model simulations. And the simulation on the top shows a world with high CO2 but no solar geoengineering. And the uh, maps on the bottom show a world with high, this, that same high CO2 but uh, solar geoengineering to counteract the, the warming effects from that CO2. And what you see looking at these plots is that, of course, um, you get a lot of warming with high CO2 um, and no solar geoengineering, and you get a lot of changes in precipitation, the hydrological cycle um, with high CO2. And then when you counteract that with um, a solar geoengineering scheme, uh, the, the amount of change in most places is reduced quite substantially. It's not... Um, it's not just in one area. It doesn't cause additional changes uh, in some places. It actually works pretty well to counteract regional climate change, not just global. And, and this result has really held up um, to scrutiny in the climate modeling uh, field, at least. So this, is the, this plot here shows the same thing, but with 13 different climate models instead of just one. And then finally, um, you know, the, as, as the science has progressed, um, people have looked at, you know, not just, for example, annual temperature and annual precipitation, but looking at more and more sophisticated climate metrics that are more correlated with the impacts we actually care about. So this is a figure from a more recent study that looked at the impacts of solar geoengineering counteracting greenhouse warming, um, the impacts on extreme events like um, very high precipitation, tropical storms, um, sort of hydrological extremes at the very um, local level, basically. And I won't get into what this plot is showing too much, but basically what, what this analysis showed is that almost everywhere um, that people live or everywhere over land, if you use geoengineering, solar geoengineering to counteract um, the warming from greenhouse gases, uh, you reduce the changes that have occurred in that place, right? So if a, uh, someplace gets drier with global warming, almost every drier place gets less dry if you then apply solar geoengineering. And likewise, places that are getting wetter in terms of their extreme precipitation, um, those places when you apply solar geoengineering, uh, it, it gets less wet. You get less extreme precipitation effects. Um, and so in terms of these sort of climate variables that people like to look at in climate models, uh, solar geoengineering is working surprisingly well to reduce the sort of climate effects that we're worried about. Let me see. So in summary, like the good when it comes to solar geoengineering is really that um, the effects of climate change can be reduced quickly in most places and low direct cost. The bad now, um, of course, it, it, 
it, of course the bad has to come because uh, it's a crazy idea, right? So, so uh, you know, this this talk is going faster than I expected it to, but, but let me get at the gist of the bad, which is that the fact of the matter is, is that um, it, reducing sunlight is just not the same thing as reducing uh, greenhouse gases, right? And so I'm going to give a very concrete example here, which is that CO2, when we think about its effects on the hydrological cycle, CO2 has multiple effects on the hydrological cycle, and some of those just can't be counteracted by reducing sunlight. So the big thing that dominates the effect we observe in, for example, global precipitation when we raise CO2 is the fact that temperature then goes up, and so evaporation and precipitation go up as well. So that's this number one effect that CO2 has on the hydrological cycle. But CO2 actually has other effects on the hydrological cycle as well. So for example, the other effect, the second effect is that when you put CO2 into the atmosphere, it sort of uh, on average increases um, vertical stability in the atmosphere. So uh, that actually uh, dampens precipitation. And then the third effect is that um, when you put more CO2 in the atmosphere, it causes plants to sort of close up these stomata from which they emit um, water vapor. And so precipitation goes down because of that as well. So there are these two direct effects of CO2 on the hydrological cycle that aren't affected by temperature. And so what that means is that physically, if you uh, use geoengineering, solar geoengineering to counteract uh, the the warming effect of CO2, but you don't reduce that CO2, but you bring global temperature back down to zero. You get rid of that uh, effect on precipitation and the hydrological cycle from the warming, but you're left with those precipitation decreasing effects that come from CO2 directly. Um, and this is just a figure from a study that shows that. If you remove the, the warming effect of CO2 without removing the CO2 itself, you get less precipitation. And there's really no way around that side effect. And so as a result, um, you can't simultaneously stabilize everything we care about in the climate system by counteracting greenhouse gases with a solar change. And so, for example, this shows how this figure just shows how precipitation depends not just on temperature, but on on the CO two e concentration in the atmosphere as well. And I'm just going to um, quickly make another point, which is that even if we can stabilize uh, global temperatures uh, with uh, with solar geoengineering, even if we could simultaneously stabilize both global temperature and global precipitation, um, the differences between uh, how a solar ch forcing change affects the, the climate and how a long wave or greenhouse gas forcing affects it means that, that there are gonna be regional differences. And just because the regional differences are small doesn't mean they're not consequential. So this, I did a study in 2010 that's sort of illustrative of this problem. Um, in that study, we looked at a bunch of different global cooling schemes, all of which stabilized uh, global temperatures, but at different levels, um, while allowing CO2 to keep going up. And then we looked at what the regional climate outcomes of those different uh, levels of global temperature stabilization were over time as we continued to let CO2 go up. And this is sort of the results from a typical simulation. Um, we found that this is for East Asia. And the important thing on this plot is that it shows uh, precipitation changes on the y-axis and temperature changes on the x-axis. And that circle you see there, it represents um, space that's within one standard deviation of that region's climatological baseline. Um, so it's the middle of that circle is, is where that, client, that regional climate was in the past. And so what we found in these simulations is that, you know, if you're just compensating for a little bit of CO2 with geoengineering, there's a lot of different 
settings for the global thermostat that get a lot of different regions back within one standard deviation of their past climate. Um, but as you compensate for more and more CO2 with more and more solar cooling, uh, that becomes less and less true. And then if you look at this in the context of multiple regions, so for example, now this is showing the results for both China and India and where they are when you're just compensating for a little bit of CO2 with solar geoengineering. So early in our simulations, there's a lot of agreement between the, the global thermostat settings that bring both China and India back into close to their previous climate baseline. But as time goes on, even though China and India are still a lot closer to their baseline than they were in the past, um, they, the exact global thermostat settings that, uh, that they, that get them closest to that baseline become more and more different over time. So you have this question that comes out of the physics of solar geoengineering, which is that the longer you use it to compensate for greenhouse gas driven warming, the more and more differences are likely to um, emerge regionally between preferences about how much geoengineering we should do. So you could see a situation where with a little bit of solar geoengineering, most places can agree how much they would like, but as time goes on, those preferences are gonna diverge. And so that, um, so you, that just, this just kind of shows the results for all the regions we looked at. So this sort of tension between um, different uh, different um, things that people care about and where they people are that are caring uh, is an inherent quality of using solar geoengineering to compensate for CO2. Um, and that's the reason this one shows that tension for, for example, trying to stabilize sea level rise and reduce the rate of temperature change. You can't do those things at the same time either. And so this sort of raises the possibility that even if solar geoengineering works pretty well to reduce the effects of climate change, that there's potentially gonna be a lot of global governance uh, problems associated with it. Can, can someone tell me how much, how much time do I have left? <laughs> let, let me let me skip ahead to the ugly stuff then um <laughs> okay so uh, this the point that i wanted to make here i'll come back to at the end which is just that there's really a lot we don't understand about what the impacts of solar geoengineering would be relative to the impacts of climate change yet because the science is just incredibly sparse and the way that impacts are reduced as you reduce global temperature like they are here um, for for greenhouse gas driven warming they get all screwy with solar geoengineering because a 1.5 degree world with solar geoengineering is not equal to a 1.5 degree world without it okay so let me get to the uh summarize the bad which is just that there's these imperfections that might make global governance difficult and it's premature to understand what the actual, how these climate effects translate into impacts. So a few things I just wanna to touch upon as the most important elements of the ugly is that there's just a lot of social considerations uh, that come up when we think about the risks of solar geoengineering. Um, some people just, it, the idea of intervening in the global climate system is just contrary to um, their the ethical framework within which they operate. Um, there are some people that just consider this idea itself uh, to be wrong. Um, there's also a question of whether doing this could make reducing our greenhouse gas emissions uh, less likely. I, sh I should say, so this is called a moral hazard problem. It sort of stems from this idea that when people buy insurance for things, sometimes they start acting in a more risky way. Um, there's not a lot of empirical evidence from social sciences yet that this is 
the case. But it's important to think about because I think risk perceptions of emerging technologies can change pretty quickly. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, there's this idea that thermostat setting will be an inequitable process. It could even lead to conflict. Uh, so the, those are sort of some of the, the ugly social risks. Um, in addition, there's, there's these physical considerations. So for example, um, one thing we do know about solar geoengineering is that if you use it to compensate for a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere, and then you um, stop doing it without reducing that CO2 in the atmosphere, you get what's called a termination shock, which is that global temperatures shoot back up to where they would have been if you'd never done solar geoengineering at all at a rate of change that's much, much higher than uh, it would have been um, if you'd never started blocking sunlight in the first place. And so you're, you're introducing a huge risk if you, you start doing it without knowing how you're gonna get that CO2 out of the atmosphere. Likewise, there's some effects like ocean acidification that just can't be addressed with solar geoengineering. So CO2 in the atmosphere is what causes ocean acidification. And so doing solar geoengineering can't, uh, can't fix impacts like this, which have particular, um, possibly huge consequences for ocean ecosystems. All right, let me, let me skip ahead here a little bit and just give you the summary of ugly, which is that um, basically we don't have a lot of evidence yet that uh, solar geoengineering could be used to reverse sort of the climate emergencies that people talk about using it for after we've detected some climate emergency arriving um, and that effective use of geoengineering could basically require the sort of foresight and cooperation and planning that we haven't been able to employ for emissions abatement so why should we believe it would work for solar geoengineering. All right, so I'll just wrap up really quickly and say that geoengineering is something people are talking about in the context of a portfolio of responses to climate change. The only people I know talking about it talk about it as part of things that we would do in addition to mitigation, adaptation, and removal of CO2 from the atmosphere, so negative emissions or carbon dioxide removal. So basically something like this, at, at best geoengineering is something we use in addition to cutting emissions, uh, removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and perhaps solar geoengineering has a role in um, reducing impacts or, or suffering on top of those activities. It really would be a bad idea to use it as a substitute for mitigation. And right now we're stuck with a lot of unknowns about what the impacts are. So this figure that I'm showing here, it's from the one of degrees report, right? And it shows impacts of climate change driven by greenhouse gases and the things that we've already been studying for 20 years. So this figure is something that's literally the product of thousands of, of scientists. And it's the consensus process, uh, a consensus um, product from like hundreds of scientists deliberating with each other. And we just, we don't have any information about geoengineering compared to something like this. We have, you know, not a good sense. It's this wiggly line. We don't know its shape and we don't know what the additional side effects of geoengineering are yet. And so my conclusion really is that, you know, we're, we're operating in an environment of such asymmetry when it comes to solar geoengineering um, that if people are concerned that the other pieces of our risk mitigation portfolio aren't enough to get us to a place where we feel like there's acceptable risk, the only way to um, ameliorate this or remedy this is just to do more research on geoengineering and, and very importantly to expand unity of researchers which to date is very concentrated in certain areas of the world and very homogenous. Uh, so that's the introduction to geoengineering. Um, and anytime we have, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you.